Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this evening's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm Maya, your host, and we're excited to be presenting The Rebellious Tide, a conversation with Eddie Boudel Tan in partnership with Word Vancouver and the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tokoronto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. And just a few announcements before we introduce tonight's panelists. You can check out Word Vancouver's programming, their Adore an Author program, and their silent auction at wordvancouver.ca. Their event recordings can be found on the Word Vancouver YouTube channel. And don't forget to sign up for upcoming Watts Toronto panels. This is day eight of our 10 day festival celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Earlier today, we streamed A Dream of a Woman, a conversation with Casey Plett about her newest release with Professor Grace Kaler, as well as our panel Family Secrets, Three Thrilling Page Turners with Gail Anderson Dargatz, Ashley Audrain, Robin Harding, and Lori Petro. And these can be found on our YouTube channel, The Word on the Street Toronto. For more information on our upcoming panels, visit our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all of the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoy today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. And I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator for tonight, C.E. Gachalian. Born, raised, and born, raised, and based on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, colonial, colonially known as Vancouver, C.E. Gachalian is a queer Philippine author, playwright, producer, consultant, and teacher. The author of six books and co-editor of two anthologies, he was the 2013 recipient of the Dane Ogilvy Prize and a three-time Lambda Literary Award finalist. His memoir, Double Melancholy, Art, Beauty, and the Making of a Brown Queer Man, was published in spring 2019 by Arsenal Pulp Press. Welcome, Chris. So good to have you on broadcast tonight. Great. And I'm very pleased to welcome our guest this evening, Eddie Budel Tan the author of the novels After Elias and The Rebellious Tide. He's been selected as a 2021 Rising Star by the Writers' Trust of Canada and a finalist for the Edmund White Award. His work depicts a world much like our own. The heroes are flawed, truth is distorted, and there is as much hope as there is heartbreak. As a queer Asian Canadian, Eddie celebrates diverse voices through his writing. His stories can also be found in Joyland, Yoke, Gertrude Press, and The G&LR. He lives with his husband in Vancouver and joins us tonight. Hello, Eddie. Thanks for being here. Hey, Maya. Hey, Chris. Good to see you both. Hey, Eddie. <laughs> Great. Thanks. All right. Pass it over to you guys. Thank you. Hey. Thanks, Maya. Um, well, before uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Eddie and I are live streaming this evening from the unceded and unsurrendered territories of the Musqueam Squamish and Slavery with Peoples, colonially known as uh, Vancouver. Um, thank you, Word on the Street Toronto. Thank you, Word on the Street Vancouver and Asian Canadian Writers Workshop for partnering to present this uh, this event. Um, yeah, it's uh, my very great pleasure to, to, to introduce you all to author Eddie Boudel Tan, who I'm meeting for the first time tonight. Uh, and whose wonderful novel, The Rebellious Tide, I just finished reading uh, just a few hours before this event. Um, and uh, I think we'll start off with Eddie uh, doing a reading from the novel. So um, yeah, so Eddie, take it away. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Chris. So I'm gonna be reading a short passage from The Rebellious Tide. Costas Caracas was his name. Sebastian had made that discovery several years earlier. He thought it was a strange combination of letters when he first saw it. 
an unfamiliar union of hard angles and gentle loops. The sound was even stranger when he said it aloud. Costas Caracas, Costas Caracas. He'd repeated the name until it began to make sense, until it sounded like it could belong to a person who shared his blood. His girlfriend at the time, Sophie, was throwing a party. The theme is Belle Epoque, she had said, just come dress French. Sebastian would never normally rummage through his mother's closet, but he had remembered she owned a felt beret that would work with his outfit. He found a wide rectangular box on the floor of the closet. Inside was something he'd never seen before, a white jacket with brass buttons. A single golden stripe with a diamond shape in the center was emblazoned on the epaulet of each shoulder. He knew immediately that it must have belonged to his father. It fit perfectly. Standing in front of Ruby's bedroom mirror, Sebastian saw that the jacket could have been tailored to his athletic frame. It smelled musty, like dust and dampness, and the color had yellowed over time. But it was in good shape considering its age. As he ran his hand down the inside lining, he felt something sewn into the fabric. Embroidered across the black badge were bold white letters, K. Caracas. After carefully replacing the jacket where he'd found it, Sebastian spent the next several days discovering who his father was. He didn't go to Sophie's party. He locked himself in his room with his laptop and followed the clues. It didn't take him long to find an officer in the Hellenic merchant marine named Costas Caracas. This man had dedicated his youth to sailing the world in Greek cargo vessels but it spent the past 10 years in greater comfort aboard passenger ships. One look at the man's angular face and deep green eyes told him everything he needed to know. All right, that's all I'm gonna give you for now. Great, thanks. I'm sure you've whet some people's appetites uh, with that reading. So, I hope so. Uh, I, yeah, well, I just finished your, uh, just finished reading your novel today, as I mentioned, and I just want to congratulate you on this uh, this wonderful book. Uh, I mean, it's a page turner. I mean, it really is a page turner. Um, and that's, you know, uh, dare I say this, it's not something that you often say these days about a lot of literary fiction. Um, so this is a book that you're just compelled to keep reading because of the story, right? It's, it's unabashedly uh, narrative driven. Um, and it's a, a wonderful mix of uh, social commentary and mystery, identity lit, and queer romance. So, yeah. So, bravo, bravo to you for 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 pulling Thank it you. off. Um, so, yeah. I guess uh, my first question for you is: What was the inspiration for for the rebellious tide? What was the germ? What what incited you to to write it? Hmm. Well, I think I think what it came down to was I wanted to write a novel or story, at least, about power. So I wrote The Rebellious Tide in 2019, I think it was. And it was a topic that I was really wrestling with at the time, uh, this idea about power and how some people have it and others don't. And these are hard realities that have been realities for a very long time. But... It was something that was very much on my mind then. And if anything, I think it's only amplified and accelerated since then this um, reckoning that we're in, uh, having to face this idea that, or this reality that uh, the majority of people don't really have a whole lot of power, not in its traditional sense, at least. So I wanted to write a story about that, um, a story about power and a story about um, youth and a story about belonging and and that kind of led to to the rebellious tide mm. yeah and the rebellious tide is set in a cruise ship um and i've i've myself have been on a cruise ship just once and this is many years ago and uh <laughs> it you know what I, I i'll admit i had a really good time however uh as good a time as i had I, I, it, you know, it, it, it just couldn't escape me the how the, the struct, the the structure, the hierarchy in terms of the staff and crew in the, in the ship was a real mirror of kind of the the hierarchies that are present in the world today in terms of race and class hierarchies, um, and you know the ship as metaphor for the human condition is, a, is an established trope in, in literature. Um, and in this novel, you've, you've put a very queer contemporary spin on it. So um, 
what, what, I mean, was that the reason you set it in a ship? What were kind of the, you know, what, what motivated you to, to write a novel about, uh, or a novel set in a cruise ship? Yeah, um, really incisive of you to, to pick up on that while you were on vacation, Chris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Studying the social dynamics <laughs> of the staff and crew, impressive. Not everyone well, I have to say, I, I felt guilty about how much fun I was having. I have to, I have to admit, so. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. it's not your, you know, it's not your job to, to keep everyone um, happy and treated yeah. equally, um, but, yeah, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I I would love to be able to say that the inspiration for the setting was due to some intellectual reflection, uh, but not all, in all honesty, it's, it's a bit simpler than that. At the time when I was writing the story or thinking about the story, I think I was feeling really nostalgic. Uh, so I spent a year of my life living and working on board a ship, on board a cruise ship. And at the time, I was doing a lot of reflecting, a lot of reflecting on my life and how far I've come uh, and what uh, I wanted to envision for my future. And I think a lot of that reflection had me feeling nostalgic about the time that I spent living and working on board a ship. Uh, it was, you know, probably the most <laughs> insane experience of my life. I was 21 years old. I decided to take a break from my studies because I'd always wanted to live life on the sea. And instead of <laughs> joining the Navy or instead of, you know, taking a catamaran and sailing to Tahiti, I thought I'm going to work on a cruise ship and see what happens. And uh, I did just that. And I joined, I joined that ship many, many years ago. And I just remember feeling how, oh, how do I put this? I just remember like standing on the top deck, just looking all around me at the sea spread 360 degrees around me. And the world just felt so big and so filled with possibility. And, you know, for myself being a queer Asian Canadian of immigrant parents growing up in the suburbs of Vancouver, it really just kind of opened my eyes to how big the world is and how uh, different reality is to most people um, compared to what I consider to be normal. And it was a really intoxicating feeling and it made me feel young and it made me feel like everything and anything was, was possible. And so when I was thinking about a setting for The Rebellious Tide, I wanted to tell a story about power and the disparity in power. And it seemed like the perfect place to set the story, just because mm -hmm. exactly like you said, um, there is everything that exists on land exists on a ship, just perhaps in a more intense, <laughs> heightened fashion. Um, yeah. You know, there is injustice and there is oppression and there is um, polarization. Uh, there are uh, dynamics that are not just and not fair. And uh, you see this in the world as, as you do on, on board a ship. And that was certainly reflective of my experience. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to capture that feeling of, of being young and, and um, having there be the possibility of anything being possible in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you definitely captured that. And uh, I think you definitely also captured the, um, the, the concrete details of life on a ship and, and uh, working in a ship. Uh, and now I see why you actually had, you have lived experience with that. So um, yeah, so mystery solved, but uh, that's, that's great. No, that's great. Um, so uh, my next question has to do with the, the novel's protagonist, uh, Sebastian, um, who is a queer mixed race Asian man. Um, he was a really compelling character. Uh, and, you know, when I was reading him, um, it kind of uh, brought to mind about the certain way that, uh, queer Asian men are supposed to be, you know, according to mainstream, mostly white generated representations of queer Asian men. Um, Sebastian definitely defies 
those tropes. So I'm wondering if that was a, a conscious move on your part to to create a queer Asian male uh, protagonist that doesn't fit easily into pre-built boxes. Um, and I'm also wondering how your own intersecting identities uh, shaped shaped uh, this character. Yeah, um, I have a lot of love for Sebastian as a character. I wish he were a real person. I'd be his yeah. best friend. Um, and <laughs> and I, I wanted to create a person who um, just comes from so many different places and and communities and um, backgrounds, but is not easily slotted in any 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 one of those if that makes sense like someone who inherently uh has never felt like he belonged because of his um what could be perceived as conflicting identities so yes he's mixed race he is uh queer bisexual and um you know he's grown up never really feeling like he belonged anywhere. He grows up in a small town in Quebec where he and his mother are ostracized and, and treated as other. So he's mm -hmm. grown up always feeling um, this sense of otherness and, and that's really inherent to, to his character. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of, um, you know, children of immigrants and immigrants can, can um, relate to in that you know, we are home. Uh, for myself, I was born in in uh, Vancouver, and this is my home. You know, I don't know any other home besides this city. Um, but every so often, I do feel like, you know, I am not treated like every other Canadian who who lives here um, by virtue of me being the the son of immigrants who have come from somewhere else. So, you know, a lot of people in this in this country you know like the 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 vastness of uh the canadian population um comes from so many different places uh and i think a lot of people can relate to that feeling of of being other trying to um create a home in a place uh in which we are settling in or have settled in um so that was that was certainly a conscious decision on my part to create this character that uh, can represent those feelings uh mm -hmm. And then in terms of, you know, what, you know, something that I've often wrestled with uh, just growing up as uh, the son of Asian immigrants is this um, sort of topic of, I guess, this feeling of obedience or, or this um, expectation to be obedient and passive just like you spoke to um, around mainstream media and how uh, people from the Asian community are, are represented. I think a lot of this is actually really re um, reflected in, in real life in that, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, discourse right now around the model minority and what people expect um, being Asian to be in, in North America. And I grew up feeling a lot of that, um, feeling that, you know, by, through hard work and through obedience, we can achieve the Canadian dream. Like that was um, often uh, believed in, in in my home and certainly by my parents. And um, it's something that I've often wrestled with. I've often felt like uh, I am less able to, you know, break the rules <laughs> and yeah. uh, go off and and make my own decisions and do and defy what people expect of me. Um, so in a way, I think Sebastian is is a conduit or a way for me to to release the the I suppose uh, tension that I have built yeah. up over the years, feeling that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, can, do you mind if I ask? Are your parents? How do your parents feel about you being a writer? Good, yeah. <laughs> I think, I hope so. Um, no, they've been very supportive. Uh, they sure. have, you know, it's it's funny, like there are so many Asian family stereotypes out, out there, many of which that I can relate to, but many of which don't. And, and I think that just goes to show that a stereotype is exactly what it is. You know, it's a 
gross generalization. Um, yeah. But my family has always, you know, had high expectations of me. They wanted me to be a doctor. Right. <laughs> so yeah. that's one stereotype that they might have, um, you know, have might have been true, I suppose, in, in my upbringing. But yeah. uh, my being a writer is something that I've always been passionate about. And they recognize that. I've been writing since I was a child. Um, yeah. I used to write stories. And you remember those like old Hillroy notebooks, those like pastel yeah. colored ones? And I yeah, do. Yeah. <laughs> those are my first yeah. books. Were, my first yeah. books are written in those. And my parents yeah. used to edit them. I used to make them read them. So they yeah. know that is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, so they've always been very supportive, even when I decided to go work on a cruise ship and spend, you know, years of my youth um, traveling instead of going to to school. They were supportive of that, too. So I owe a lot of um, what I've achieved uh, to their support, really. Right. Great. Well, um, you know, the last 18 months, as you know, uh, as we all know, we've been dealing with a pandemic. Um, now, you actually wrote this novel uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, but when I was reading it, it struck me very much like a, a COVID era novel. You know, um, you know, during the last 18 months, we've collectively been uh, wrestling with questions around social justice and equity you know, with, uh, you know, the discovery of the unmarked graves of Indigenous children, uh, Black Lives Matter, anti-Asian racism, uh, the Me Too movement, the divide between rich and poor. Um, I mean, at times, the rebellious tide reads very strongly like a, like an allegory for the, the social struggles that are currently front and center. Now, when I asked you about this via email earlier this week, you mentioned that, um, while most of the novel was written prior to the pandemic, you you sensed trouble brewing. So could you could you elaborate? Um, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, for sure. I it was a bit of a joke me saying that I sensed the impending trouble, um, but yeah. this trouble has always existed, and it's it existed in 2019, and it has existed long before then. I'm a very uh, socially and politically conscious person. So, you know, I think it'd be impossible for my beliefs and my uh, philosophies to not um, influence my work in, in one way or another. Um, I'm also very much a believer in that everything is political to a degree, right? Like every story is influenced and shaped by its internal and external politics. Um, so something that's hard to get away from. But certainly nowadays, it's, it's very pronounced. Um, so, so in terms of tackling specific, um, you know, issues that we as a society are struggling with today, yeah, yeah, it is certainly interesting to, to you know, reread or revisit my book now uh, in the context of that having uh, lived through so many recent, um, you know, reckonings with uh, race and oppression and um, and injustice. So I, I would say that something that I'm very conscious again of not doing is using my work as a soapbox. You know, this is not when I write a novel, I don't I'm not trying to communicate a specific um, ideology or belief. Um, it is not meant to uh, convey a, a message that is, you know, social or political. Um, yeah. Rather, what I hope that I do is ha is help or get people thinking about those those issues. Um, if anything, I think the rebellious tide specifically is is almost the opposite in that it doesn't assert any one ideological view. It asserts many, and it and it kind of um, you know interrogates, but then also uh, flips them in in a lot of a lot of the ways. I think you know a really important uh, theme in this novel is this idea that there is really no like the what's right and what's wrong is not so black and white. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many shades of gray in between, and I one of my fears is that we as a society are becoming uh, too myopic. In, in many ways in which we are oversimplifying the complexity of, of the world. Um, you know, we 
each of us feels a need to pick a side and, and have a stance. Uh, and in so doing, um, you know, what could be a healthy conversation often becomes more of a um, more of a, a battle than it than it really needs to be. And and that's one of the underlying themes of the rebellious tide is um, almost this warning against oversimplifying um, the world and, and how people view the world. Yeah. Well, that's a really great, a really good point, um, Eddie, because I, I mean, I, I don't remember the world being as polarized as, as it is now, you know, it's really kind of terrifying how polarized we all are. Um, so I think, yeah, I think one of the great things about your novel is that it does lean into the complexity, right. Uh, and the nuances. Um, so, um, yeah, so yeah. Bravo, to you, bravo to you for that. Thank you. Um, I hope so. Just one one last thought on that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just I, I want to be transparent in that part of a, a huge part of uh, Sebastian's character is inspired by myself as a younger man. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's very, he very much reminds me of what I was like when I was younger, because I have always um, been a very um, strong believer in things you know like i've always believed in things and i've always felt very passionate about passionate about things um and where i often um where i often you know found trouble was uh my own oversimplification of of really complex issues and and that happened to me when i was younger you know i would I had a, a tendency to to view the world uh, more simplistically and myopically, and than I should have. Um, so a big part of Sebastian's character uh, kind of reflects, yeah, myself as as a younger man making the same mistakes that he makes. Yeah, and that leads me to my next question, which is um, speaking of you know related to believing strongly in things. Um, you know, one of the big themes in the novel for me is is anger. You know, um, and uh, I mean, as a queer racialized person, I've been dealing with anger my whole life. Um, but during the last eighteen months, it's been you know, an especially salient emotion because of all the you know the shit that has been unearthed. Um, the novel, I think, really deftly addresses how. Uh, marginalized folks are often blamed for their own anger uh, by people with power and privilege. I mean, we're, we're often told that our anger is the result of things that we're making up in our heads that were delusional for being as angry as we are. I mean, I, I've heard this a number of times as a queer racialized person. Uh, it's gas. It's gaslighting, really, of the yeah. worst kind. Um, but. Again, what I really like about the rebellious tide is how it unpacks the complexity of anger. Um, yes, anger can do us in, it can swallow us whole, it can lead us to do terrible things. And it can also be the catalyst for extraordinary and necessary incitement and change. Um, could you talk a little more about the role of anger in this novel and, and what this novel is attempting to convey? um about anger yeah uh, uh anger is can be a very healthy thing it is an important um force that if channeled correctly can result in a lot of good and i think we all have a lot of reason to be and feel angry um what we do with that anger is is really what what's in question um, so I grew up um, in an environment where we weren't like really encouraged to to be angry, you know, to to let ourselves um, express our emotions freely. You know, what was valued in my family growing up was composure and and uh, self control, mm -hmm. and and through you know, the years I've realized how important it is to let us feel what we feel and express that and and use it for, you know, good to to help us get what we want. Um, and anger is, is certainly an important piece of that. Um, 
Yeah, it's it, it is really interesting. Like in in Sebastian's character, I, I knew from the start that that would be a fundamental part of his character because you know in the, at the surface he's a very somewhat of a mild mannered you know young man. He um, is very sensitive and very sweet. Um, and then what the reader learns uh, throughout the story is he uh, has a lot of anger just stored inside him. Um, what he mm -hmm. You know where he uh, ends up, I guess, falling short is that anger has in the past, um, you know, exploded and and not been expressed in in um, in healthy ways. And I think there's so much good that can come from anger. It is, like you said, a catalyst for for good. Like every social and civic movement um, has started with anger, right? Like if you look at, you know, the civil rights movement, if you look at Stonewall, like these are riots, like there was violence in the streets. If you look at all of the, um, you know, all of the really important movements that have happened recently over the past year, um, that is happening because we are angry and we have yeah. all the reason in the world to be angry. And we are doing something with that anger and holding those with power accountable. And that's what we do, do need to do. Those are dogs there. <laughs> not my dogs. That's not the dogs, dogs just like strolling down the street. Okay. Don't worry, okay. they're, they're fine. Oh, cool. They sound angry. Those yeah, angry. angry. <laughs> yeah. What I will um, say about anger, just like what I will say about anger is something that yeah. um, Sebastian learns in the story is, you know, one of the, what I've learned in terms of like dealing with my own anger and, and being able to express my own feelings is, um, I think logic is, is one of the most important tools when it comes to dealing with one's anger. Cause you know, I think, you know, there are a lot of angry people out there who, um, perhaps aren't dealing with it as in as healthy a way as they could. And, and I think anger can lead to oversimplification, right? Like either thinking that, um, kind of, oversimplifying um, what it can be very complicated. Um, it can lead to really extreme thinking, right? Thinking that any decision can either lead to great success or a terrible failure. Um, and I think, you know, logically we know that that's not true, but an angry person might not realize that. So, so certainly something that I've learned. Great, great point. Um, my next question is related to something you mentioned earlier about uh, not uh, using your work as necessarily a soapbox. Um, in, in many ways, um, The Rebellious Tide, I, I would see as a, as a political novel without it being overtly. So um, the politics are, are beautifully embedded in the story, but the story is still front and center. Um, so I think you've touched on this a little bit already, but um, maybe you can expand a little bit more about how as a literary, literary artist, um, how you balance addressing, you know, issues uh, while telling a compelling story, or are they one and the same for you? Yeah, um, like I think I mentioned earlier about how I, I do believe that every story is social and political um, to a degree, and I, and I think that rather than those issues being front and center in in this novel, um, what's really more meaningful is the the human story, and that's often where I start with when I write a story. Is I start with the the person, so the character, and I you know really think through you know what does that character want, and what does that character believe, and why do they believe what they believe, and and um, and then, it, and, then it, and then it goes from there. So when it comes to it being a, a political novel, I don't disagree with you because it does confront um, real, uh, you know, current uh, issues uh, that we are all experiencing today uh, pretty head on. Things like sexism and homophobia and assault and oppression and injustice. Like those are all things that are not dealt with subtly <laughs> in the rebellious tide. Yeah. Um, but what's at the center of it are the people, the people who are affected. Not just Sebastian, but you know, all of the the people he encounters who 
um, are struggling through these um, these issues who um, are finding uh, that they don't really have a voice and and obviously that, that kind of galvanizes as the story progresses. Um, but really, yeah, focusing on the people and the human story and the relationships is is what's most important to me and how they then together navigate through um, these political issues and realities. That's great. Um, I just have to say the relationship um, between Sebastian and his mother Ruby, I thought was just beautifully written. I just want—I just wanted to say that it just really moved me as as the son of a single mother. Um, also, uh, really, it really landed with me. So I just wanted to to convey that. Um, Thank you. I'm a mama's um, boy, so it was um, easy yeah, for me to do. <laughs> I am too. I'm a total mama's boy. So. Um, all right, I just, I just want to be mindful of time. Uh, do we have any questions from the uh, the audience? Um, no questions so far. Okay, well, we have a, I have a couple more kind of questions that we can uh, kind of use to round out the uh, the session. Um, so, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a fun question from one writer to another. I mean, you know, tell me about your writing practice. I mean, do you write? Uh, do you write every day? Do you read every day? I mean, how do you, like, how do you generate story ideas? Hmm. I do not write every day. I wish. Mm -hmm. I wish I had that discipline, um, but I do try. So when it comes to thinking about stories, what I've been doing a lot lately, uh, especially throughout this past year, uh, is observe. And I think that is one of the, the um, silver linings of this pandemic era is I have less distraction in my life and I've been finding that I have more time to observe. So mm -hmm. you know, I'll be sitting beside a window and just watching the dogs go by or I'll be lying in the park and just listening to the sound of the birds. You know, just being able to slow down and, and let myself um, just be there, you know, and be present. I think has become a really important part of my process, uh, more so mm -hmm. than it has been before. And it does allow for ideas to, you know, uh, germinate. And, and that has been really, really wonderful. But in terms of like my process, yeah, like I, I try to write as much as I can. What I do find is when I'm, I often, I write a lot of stories. Some of them, I write a lot of short fiction. Um, mm -hmm. And as on top of novels, I'm working on my third novel now. And what I do find is when I begin a novel, I become a little obsessed. <laughs> like, I don't know, Chris, if you can relate, but I get like really fixated on it, almost in an unhealthy way. So when that happens, yeah. I probably do end up writing every day because that's all I can think about is, you know, getting back at it and, and getting the ideas out because I'm so worried about losing them, you know, or, or losing, yeah. losing the momentum. How about yourself? Yeah. Like, do you do you relate to that? I I do. I mean, um, it depends. I mean, usually, I mean, I'm really good with deadlines. So when I'm on a deadline, uh, it you know the stress of it actually, in a way, not in a way. I mean, I think it really does light a fire under me, and and it helps me get into that uh, what neurologists call the flow state. You know that that state of just where you just lose track of time and everything else and you're kind of just you are you are whatever action it is you're performing so in this case it's writing i mean i am I, the writing is i'm just kind of at one with it right so but deadlines tend i mean that tends to happen with me when i'm closing in on a writing deadline <laughs> so um yeah yeah but i can so i i can definitely i can definitely relate to, to what you're saying. And also, I mean, do you think the pandemic has, you mentioned that the, that, you know, the pandemic has, has helped slow things down um, for you and, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if, I mean, has there been a downside to you for, as a writer um, with the pandemic in terms of, uh, you know, the fact that there's just been, you know, less things less things have, you know, to go to, uh, you know, that life has, that the pace of life has uh, slowed down considerably. Do you see any um, 
negatives or downsides from a writing point of view to kind of the last 18 months that we've been living through? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the reduction in human face-to-face -face interaction must have some sort of <laughs> negative impact, I would think. Um, yeah. Yeah, everything. My dialogue is probably going to sound like a Zoom call going forward. I'm actually really worried that the next time I go to an actual party in person yeah. live that I'll just talk to everyone as if I'm on a Zoom call. Like, I'll just feel like leaning in too close and yeah. over enunciating. Um, but you know what? Like, honestly, nothing really comes to mind. I like I can certainly see a lot of downsides in almost every other facet of life and and yeah. certainly downsides when it comes to bringing a book into the world, you know, the publishing side, certainly uh, the mm -hmm. pandemic has had profound negative impacts. Um, but in terms of like a, a, a from a writing standpoint, um, I can't say that it has apart from like I did say that one of the benefits that I've seen is the uh, absence of distraction. And I would say that that's not necessarily a true statement like it distractions in the way of like social engagements and other all these other demands of my time sure like those are certainly reduced but um especially in the early days of the pandemic um i was certainly distracted by bigger more important things in writing right like yeah the health, the health of me and my family and and right. the world at large so so those are things were certainly distracting and and it definitely had a negative impact on my writing because i just could not write a word because i had Particular things to to be concerned with, um, right. but uh, but yeah. So so I, I don't think it's impacted my my process these days. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we'll see. Maybe <laughs> like not that I can identify now, but right. subconsciously, who knows? Who knows? You know what has been altered beneath the surface. Awesome. All right. Well. Um... Uh, any qu any? I just want to uh, uh, reiterate: if you have any questions uh, for Eddie, fire away. You have a few more minutes. Um, I mean, we do have a few more minutes. I don't know, Eddie, if you'd be interested in maybe reading another like uh, short excerpt from the book. Are you? Would you be prepared to do that? Or sure. <laughs> okay. All right. I was not prepared, but but I can okay. certainly do that. Um, I joked earlier that I would just flip the pages and then and then read wherever my finger landed, yeah. but perhaps I won't do that. Okay, I'll read a short one. Right. Sex with Nikos felt like an act of rebellion. Their bodies came together at the altar of the House of the Heel, their secret temple. This little room with a starlit sky painted above them was designed to be a place of worship. Yet the two men used it to worship each other instead of God. They bowed their heads and confessed sins in each other's ears. The purity of the white curtains spread out from under them. This rebellion was against man, not God. Only man could hate something as pure as sex. Okay, thank you. I, I was hoping you'd read one of the uh, love scenes or from one of the love scenes in the book. Cause I, I have to tell you that, you know, I think um, I mean, love scenes aren't the easiest thing to write. Uh, but I think you've done them very skillfully in this yeah. novel. You, you really, no, you really have. And um, maybe it's just because of where I am. Cause as a single guy, uh, the last 18 months have been, as you can imagine, really, 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 really hard. Um, so uh, maybe I just, you know, part of me was responding to the to the sensual, like the, the sensuality of those scenes. So we all need yeah. a bit of sexiness in our lives. Oh, absolutely. I know. <laughs> <laughs> especially now. Um, awesome. Okay. Well, uh, we're at time. Um, yeah, well, mm -hmm. I it was. I mean, Eddie, thank you so much for for uh, sharing with us and for reading from the Rebellious Tide. And um, yeah, and I'll hand it back to uh, to Maya. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can't believe we got treated to two readings. So thank you very much, Eddie, for all of your insights about the Rebellious Tide, and to Chris. Thank you for guiding us through tonight's conversation. It's just been a joy to sit in the wings and listen to you both. Uh, and thank you also to our presenting partners. Word Vancouver and the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. 
And lastly, to everyone tuning in from home, just a big old wad of gratitude from us at Watts Toronto. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And if you'd like to pick up a copy of The Rebellious Tide by Eddie Boudel Tan, you can find it at our virtual bookstore in partnership with Another Story Bookshop and our official ebook and audiobook seller, Rakuten Kobo. You have until the final day of the festival, which is tomorrow, uh, Sunday, sorry, to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival you tune in, we'll announce one bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is REBEL. We'll be back tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m., with our panel Diaspora Dialogues in conversation with Isabella Wang and Linda Rui Feng, discussing Chinese culture and a special celebration with the 2021 Trillium Book Award shortlisted authors will follow that. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, visit our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. Thank you very much again for joining us and have a great evening. <laughs>